Good morning. Welcome to Black Gum Baptist Church. Got a couple of announcements before we get started this morning. Be sure and pick up a bulletin um, because there's things in there that uh, I won't be mentioning. There's always some extra stuff in there. Um, but a couple of things that I do want to mention, don't forget that tonight at 5 o'clock will be our uh, potluck dinner and our business meeting. Um, so uh, be sure and come to that tonight. Uh, next Sunday, next Sunday is going to look a little different. We're going to have our Bible study, small group, something. We don't really know what to call it here at the church. And the reason for that is for the next part, and I'm going to throw somebody under the bus because the somebody that, that the rest of this is about doesn't know that I'm about to say this. But um, we have a, a longtime church member that has been, had anything and everything that you can imagine to do with this church, his hands have been involved in. Um, Mr. Frank Lawson, this Wednesday, is going to be turning 90 years old. So next Sunday... <laughs> Next Sunday, we're going to have our, our meeting here, have a, have a little Bible study of some sort, devotion, um, and then we're going to celebrate afterwards with cake and ice cream, something. So, um, so be sure and mark that on your calendars. We'll be here at 5 o'clock tonight. We'll be here at 5 o'clock next Sunday. Um, and I think that's all I have of first importance. So let's uh, have a word of prayer. The worship team comes forward and we'll begin our worship here this morning. Lord, we uh, just thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to come together to just to worship you, to sing praises to you, Lord, to hear from you through your word today. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would work in this time, that you would touch our hearts, that you would draw people to you, that you would strengthen our faith. Um, and through it all, Lord, we ask that you would be glorified. We ask it all in your name. Good morning, everyone. I invite you all to stand, and we are going to sing to the Lord this morning.
Father, we just thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We, we thank you for the life that we have to experience the, the goodness that you have offered us in this world, Lord, but we thank you so much more for the eternal life that we have to experience the goodness of your grace and the goodness of your presence in eternity. Lord, we thank you that because of your goodness and because of your grace, you sent your son to pay our debt. Lord, we, we thank you that we are entirely free, free from our bondage to sin, free from the consequences for our sin, the immediate consequences and the eternal. Lord, we thank you that we have life, that we have eternal life, Lord. We thank you for the unity that we have in your son. And we just pray this morning that you would help us to grow as disciples, help us to grow in our affection for you and our affections toward one another. Lord, help us to be edified by your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
If y'all haven't guessed already, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews this morning. We're going to finish up chapter 5. I'm going to be reading verses 1, or I'm sorry, 11 through 14. Um, so as you're looking for that, I should kind of, kind of give you where, where this passage is going. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a commonality, I guess you could say. I think that would be, uh, be safe to say most, for sure, but I would say probably in every uh, child, um, somewhere throughout our life, whether it's when we're four or five, eight or 10, 12, maybe a teenager, um, somewhere throughout our childhood, um, we have the same desire. And that desire is to grow up. As children, we want to grow up. Now, as adults, we would like to go back sometimes, but, but uh, children want to grow up. We, they may want to become like an older sibling. Um, they may want to become like mom or dad, uh, maybe a, uh, a person that uh, they, they respect or look up to, maybe someone that they think has a, a cool job or uh, maybe even a superhero, something like that. But they all have this desire to grow up. I want to, I wanna, maybe they see some freedom in that. Whatever the, the, the cause may be, we did have this desire to grow up. But yet, as Christians, as born-again believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, oftentimes we don't have this desire. So often, we just are fine to just be comfortable where we're at, but the problem is we know from previous uh, passages that we've studied, there is no neutral position. There is no just hanging out in the Christian life. You grow or you regress. And today, what we see in the message um, is regression. The author of Hebrews is telling this particular group that he's speaking to, this particular however many that may be in this category, um, and us today that may be in this category, he's saying you need to grow up. Spiritually speaking, you need to grow up. You need to mature in the faith. And there, there's, there's good reason for it, and uh, we'll get into that. You know, before I read the, the passage, I just want to read one, one verse, just for, uh, actually it's two verses, just for some, some encouragement. It's in the, the Gospel of Luke. You know, we go to the Gospel, we got Jesus, right? The verse is this, To you I will give all this authority and their, and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Sounds great, doesn't it? I heard, I heard somebody, somebody spotted somebody spotted it. You think it's Luke, it's the gospel, it's Jesus, right? Jolie knows that that's the words of Satan speaking to Jesus. So why do I bring that up? Because that's the whole point of this message and where it's going is that, is that we have to grow up in our faith and grow up in our knowledge um, of the Lord lest we be taken off into another direction. So if you find your place and you are able, please stand and honor a reading God's word. We're going to go to Hebrews 5 verses 11 through 14. He says, about this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Lord, we come before you this morning just, just asking Lord, that uh, you would have your way in this service, Lord, that you would open hearts, that you would open minds, um, that you would allow scales to fall off the eyes of the blind, Lord, that you would just help us to see from your word today um, that you are greater, that you are the only, um, that you are superior to all other things, and Lord, that we need to have a desire to seek um, after you 
Lord, I pray um, specifically right now, Lord, that you would um, be my strength in this time of weakness. Lord, that you would just speak through me, that I would not be heard, but Lord, your voice from your word would speak uh, today. We ask it all in your name. Amen. So the first thing that we see in our text today is there's a problem. There's a problem going on. The author has been speaking about Jesus as our high priest. He has introduced this uh, somewhat mysterious character of Melchizedek, and he, he wants to go deeper into this subject. He's telling his audience, there is much to say about this, but there's a problem. He says, the problem is you're not ready to hear it. You have become dull of hearing. Now, this have become is very important. Um, so I want to make note here. I don't know what translation you're using. Um, the ESV puts this, this phrase, have become, in verse 11. The King James puts it in verse 12. The original Greek language puts it in bo both, both verses. Um, my point being, it is clear from the text, these people have become dull of hearing. They weren't always this way. And I bring that out because we may have, you know, in our mind, we may say, well, I'm not that way. I'm not that way. Like they, they could have said that at one time as well. We have to be careful that we do not become this way. That's the, the warnings that have been through Hebrews all along. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. But be careful lest you drift away from that. Be careful that you heed to this and to these warnings. So they have become this way. This has not always been their state. They have regressed from where they were in the faith. And uh, many people today, um, I, I can admit there's been times when I've been this way myself. We become stagnant in our faith. We become stagnant um, in our walk with the Lord, and we, we don't move on in our spiritual life. We just stay in one place. So he says they're dull of hearing. If you want to look down in uh, the next chapter in verse 12, you'll see a word. You, your translation may say slothful or maybe sluggish. It's the same original word. So you have dull or slothful, sluggish, um, this is, this is where they are in their, in their faith. Now, when I think of things being dull, slothful, sluggish, I think of an inability to perform at top tier. Like, you think of someone maybe that um, is sleep deprived. Oftentimes, you know, somewhere in our life, I'm sure um, every mother in here can attest to a time when they've been sleep deprived. Um, or maybe you've had surgery and you've had to be put under and you're, you're coming out of this, this medication and you're, you're groggy, um, you're slow, your reactions are slow, you're not supposed to operate heavy equipment, right? Isn't that what all the labels always say? Um, because your senses aren't what they should be. You can't react like you should. You don't understand like you should. That's where they were at spiritually. That was where they were at in their spiritual understanding. Now, two weeks ago, Summit was preaching um, in chapter 4 in verse 16 and he made a comment that I, wanna, I want us to, to get to um, before we really get into this message um, that I think is very important for this passage today um, the verse let me read chapter 4 verse 16 let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need now, that was his last point in the, in the sermon, and, and it was, it was uh, I think it was, uh, Jesus offers us help, and we access this help by drawing near to God. Now, there's a correlation here between, and I think some have brought it out, I don't remember the exact, exact wording, but there's a correlation between drawing near to God and our ability to fight sin. And I'll add to that, and our ability to walk according to the ways that we are to walk. So drawing near to God is what gives us this power to um, fight our sin. That was his, his point. But he said something that I will try not to butcher. It won't be in his exact words. But he says you can read an encouraging verse like this. Draw, draw near to God. He will help you. You can read an encouraging verse like this on Sunday morning. 
But if you never put it to action, if you never put it to, to work in your life, then there's no value in it. There's, no, there's nothing good comes from it. Nothing at all. Um, and so I, I bring this up because as we look into the, the rest of this passage, it can be, maybe not everybody's this way, but I've realized that everybody has different ways of thinking of things. And it can be that you look at this and you start to think that this is purely intellectual. That their problem was that they did not have enough knowledge. That is not the case at all. They did not have enough knowledge, but the problem is not just knowledge. Our faith is not built on knowledge alone. We need the knowledge. Our, our doctrine, and I, I know that, that, that can be a, a bad word to some, just teaching, our teaching, our beliefs, our biblical beliefs, the things that we stand on, extremely important. You know, look at the book of James. But if you don't put them to use, they're of no value. We don't just get the knowledge. We have to put it to work. And that's where their problem was, was not just that they didn't know, but they, they weren't using it. I'm sure everybody has, has heard this analogy, um, but it's a good picture to have in your mind of a sponge. You know, you have a sponge on your, on your kitchen sink that you use. It gets wet, and you ignore it, and then you come into your house one day, and you're like, what in the world is that smell? That's what happens to many Christians. We sit, we soak, and we sour. We've got to be wrung out. We've got to be wrung out. That is putting the stuff to use. And um, James 2 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one, one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things they need for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So what James is saying here very clearly is that our faith and our knowledge are of no value. They're not true faith if we don't put legs to it. If we don't put hands and feet to it. We have to act out. Works do not save us, but a true salvation works. We work out our salvation. Um, so that's not um, necessarily part of this message other than to let you understand if you happen to get to thinking on that, in that, getting that line of thinking. It's not purely an intellectual thing. So point number one, he says that they are students who should be teachers. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. So they were students who need to be teachers. They're not new converts. We know this because he says by this time. How much time? We don't know. And I think there's a good reason we don't know. Because then we would be trying to put a time on when our sanctification was supposed to be at a certain point. We're at different points in our life spiritually. We have setbacks and advances different than one another. The point here is they had plenty of time to be farther than where they were at. They should have been farther along. They should have been teachers by this time, but instead they needed someone to teach them. Now, does this say that everyone, every Christian should, be, should hold the office of a teacher in the church? Absolutely not. Not everyone is called to be a teacher or a preacher, but every Christian is a teacher. Every Christian should be a teacher. Now, who are you teaching? Are you teaching from a classroom? Possibly. You could be teaching your children, your grandchildren, neighbors, friends, strangers. But all of us on some level should be teachers. That's what he's saying here. You should be teaching on some level. Uh, you know, oftentimes some of the best teaching and the best learning comes from one-on-one. -on -one. Oftentimes, some of our best teaching is 10 or 15 minutes before or after a church service. We hear those things sometimes when we don't hear anything that comes from here. Um, and we can ask questions and we can, we can get involved. But we all, on some capacity, should be teachers. And he says that this group needed someone to reteach them the basics. 
Here's how we know for sure that they had regressed. They had already been taught. They already knew the basics. But now they, had, they needed someone to reteach them. They should have been teaching, teaching somebody some geometry. And instead, someone's having to teach them some basic addition and subtraction. They should have been writing books, and someone's having to teach them their alphabet. That's kind of that's, that's the picture that he's giving here. So they needed to be taught what the basic principles, again. So what are the, some of the basic principles? I think if we had a, uh, everybody made a list, they would be differing. I have no doubt that they would. Um, but I thought about maybe what we might teach at VBS, some of the things we might teach in a, a children's Sunday school class. Um, unless it's my wife's and she's going to be teaching stuff that I can't understand, but uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but, uh, you know, things like God is creator. That was the main theme of our VBS that we just went through. God creator, um, God sustainer, God empower. Um, but we think about things like, um, you know, things that, that, that people might learn when they come to church on Christmas or Easter. Um, we have, uh, you know, Jesus' birth, his, his incarnation, um, his death, burial, and resurrection, um, uh, the fall of man, original, original sin. We have things like that. And the, these are extremely important uh, doctrinal teachings. They are the very foundation of our beliefs. They are the things that we must learn in order to come to the faith. I mean, they are the, the basics of our foundation. But they are that. They are the basics. They are the basics. Um, we can't leave them behind, but we have to build up on them. We have to build from them. J.I. Packer said it this way, we never move from the gospel. We move on, I'm sorry, we never move on from the gospel. We move on in the gospel. So those basics never leave us. We bring them along everywhere we go. But we must build from that. We must move forward. So he says they, they were students who should be teachers. Then he says they are milk drinkers who should be eating meat. Now, there is nothing wrong with milk. Uh, milk is good. Matter of fact, I'd say milk is pretty great. Um, but it's the most basic of our food source. Like, that's what we feed babies. That's, that's where we start out as humans, as, as in, in you know, the animal world, the mammals. Um, that's where we start out um, is drinking milk. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good. But if you're an adult that only takes in milk, there's probably a, an issue there. Um, we have to start introducing that baby to more food. You know, may, and I don't, hopefully don't get too hungry in here and lose you, but, um, you know, you think about maybe some mashed potatoes at some point. Um, you know, maybe some, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back down, maybe some smashed peas. That, that might help with you not getting too hungry. Um, some cereal, oatmeal type, type cereals. Eventually, they get teeth, they can chew, and you introduce them to more solid foods. I mean, that, everybody knows that progression. Everybody sees that. That's not anything new to anybody. That's where we need to be in our spiritual life. We're stuck on milk sometimes, and we need some mashed potatoes. We need to be working up to some solid foods. Um, that's the progression, and, and that's where we're supposed to go with the truths of God's Word. He says that... Uh, for everyone who loves, who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. If that's all you have is milk, you're not going to go any farther in your understanding of God's word. You're stuck with milk. Milk's great. Don't lose the milk. But milk is best used for washing down steak, right? Have a big juicy steak and wash it down with a big glass of milk. Um, so you have to move past the basics of God word, God's word or you do not move past, but move along with, um, or you'll forever remain unskilled in it. That's exactly what he says here. Um, but you must stay within it. We don't go outside of God's word learning about God. Everything must line up with God's word. We can't go outside of it to try to um, learn about God. That is, that is how he has chosen to reveal himself to us is through his word, through Christ and through um, his, his written word. So any, any teaching that doesn't line up with that um, is a, a false teaching. So milk, 
The milk is the basics that were spoken of earlier. Same thing. The milk is the basics. Uh, you think of the, the basic gospel message. Here, here, here is where, and I say basic, the basic gospel message you say is good news. If I come up to you and say, hey, I got some good news, and then I walk away, didn't really do you any good, right? So, so the good news has to be I- I explained. So, so the basic gospel message, God is holy, man is sinful, that separates man from God. In order for man to be reconciled with God, there must be a redeemer, something to bring them back together, a mediator. That is Jesus. Jesus is what we have to bring him, bring us back to God. Jesus became our redeemer in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. And we, we through faith, believe in what God, what God has done through Christ, and that brings us reconciliation with uh, God. He, Christ takes our sin upon himself, puts his righteousness on us. He does it all by his grace. There's nothing we can do to earn it, nothing we can do to work for it, nothing we can do to even desire it lest he draw us to himself. That's milk. That's pretty heavy stuff, but it's just milk. If you don't have that, you have nothing. That's the milk. That's the milk, the basics. That's the gospel. One of the consequences that we have if we don't move past this milk, if we don't introduce some mashed potatoes in our life, if we don't get up to some, to some more solid food, one, one of it, and oftentimes we don't even know that it's a consequence until we go past it. Um, but we miss so much that God wants to reveal to us. We miss things in his word that he would love to reveal to us. And it brings joy and it brings fulfillment. And most of all, it builds our faith. It makes us desire his word, makes us desire him and that relationship more and more. Also, one of, our, one of the big problems when we don't grow in it, we read passages in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and all we see are stories of morality. Do this. Don't do that. You know, slay your Goliaths. That's all we see. We miss Jesus. We miss redemption. We miss everything that it's pointing to. There's all kinds of things in the Old Testament that we can read and completely miss Jesus if we don't have our eyes tuned for that or in, uh, we're not um, growing in faith. What God says back here in the Old Testament are, are the words of Jesus. We talk about Jesus' words being over here in the New Testament written in red. Jesus is the second person of the eternal triune God. What, what God says back here is Jesus. Jesus is God. It's the same God. Don't act, I mean, you may not, some may not realize this, but some Bibles don't even have red letters in them. <coughs> I'm not sure where Jesus got a red pen anyway, but anyway, moving on. Um, we all, every one of us, I, I say every one of us, maybe, maybe there's some that don't, but I feel like on some level, big or small, at some time in our spiritual walk, we have doubts. Now, those doubts may be fleeting, like, you know, you, you, the thought crosses your mind, and then and just as quick as you think of that, Scripture comes into your mind that refutes it, and you're moving on. I'm, I'm good. I don't, you know, I'm past that. Or it may be something that you struggle with day after day after day. But on some level, I think we all have some doubts. The more we see through God's truth, the more, we, the more we come to know him, the more we learn of him through his word, the stronger our faith becomes. And when our faith is up here, the doubts go a little bit farther down. Or they cancel out a lot quicker. Not to say we may not have a doubt, maybe not to say we don't have a, a, a thought, we may read something and we're like, how could this be? But when your faith is built on God is good, then you filter things through that is good. I may not understand this, but God is good. And when we, when, when I, this is just an example from myself, 
when I'm reading something in Scripture and I see a connection of two things that were written, penned by two different men on two different continents, thousands of years apart, but their, their connections, they're the same, that builds my faith. I have faith in Christ because I know he sent me his word because this book is nothing short of a miracle. And when I see those connections, my faith in God is built. So the more I see of God, the more I can't see without God. That become, that's, that's what we need to be seeing everything through the lens of God, through the lens of his word. It's what we call a biblical worldview. We need to filter everything that we see through Scripture. So they were students who should have been teachers. They were milk drinkers who should have been eating uh, milk drinkers who should have been eating meat, solid foods. And then we see that they are children who should be mature adults. So the food analogy continues into adulthood. Um, it says that those who are mature are those who are on solid food. Um, so so as, as, uh, as we, just like a baby, progresses in their food, we need to progress in our uh, knowledge and understanding of God's word. We've had enough of that. I mean, we understand that. That's, that's you know, I want to move on a little bit to um, exactly what this maturity is. Who is, who is mature? Yes, they eat solid food, but what, what does that mean? What are we doing to mature into adulthood? Who are the meat eaters? This is where the progression of this passage is leading. There was a problem up front. The problem was they were dull of hearing. The solution is they understand. That's where, that's where they need to be. We need to be in a place where we understand God's word so that when we in, in, uh, engage with the, the deeper things of God, we can understand them. We can build and we can grow in our faith. So who are the mature? Don't, don't confuse maturity with age, um, especially spiritual maturity is not a, uh, a uh, product of age. Um, I could give you some examples, but you would know these people, so I'm not going to do that. Um, on both sides of that spectrum. Um, but even our spiritual age, in other words, how long we have been believers, how long we've been a Christian, that should play into it, absolutely. But it doesn't always have a great indicator. I've uh, told you before, I, I wasted many years of my Christian life sitting and soaking and souring. And now, on the other side of it, I can say, don't do that. Don't do that. You, you miss. You're missing um, that growth. And, and it's, it's a good thing to grow in the Lord. So the spiritually mature, he says right here, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The point is not just to gain knowledge. The point is you're going to be faced with things in your life and you need to understand and be able to discern are they good or are they bad. And if we don't know God's word, if we don't know the truth of God, we cannot do that. And I'll give you some examples of that here in a moment. Um, but let's break this down, this, this part of this verse, um, starting with discernment. What is discernment? Discernment is simply just proper judgment. It, it's being able to, to perceive things rightly. Is it true? Is it false? Um, this, discernment goes hand in hand with our spiritual growth. Obviously, the more, the more we grow, the more discerning we become. As we learn more and more about God's word, it also goes hand in hand with wisdom. Um, and I would say even experience, sometimes even bad experience. Um, bad experiences create wisdom and discernment. They should. They should because you should, if you learn from it, you're going to know, okay, don't do that again. And the next time you can discern between that uh, falsehood and, and truth. Hebrews 4.12, um, I think this was part of what I preached last time, um, talks about God's word being discerning. 
You want to know if what you believe is right? Get into God's word. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sometimes we don't even know why we do stuff, but you get into God's word and God will reveal why you're doing it and if it's good or not. Um, we need discernment. Charles Spurgeon uh, says discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's also knowing the difference between right and almost right. Think about that for a minute. Uh, so much teaching today. So many people are teaching things that are almost right. You know what almost right is? It's wrong. Almost right is wrong. Scripture warns us over and over and over of false teaching and false teachers. I have not went through the New Testament to, to look at this for myself, but I've been told by a trustworthy source that only one book in the New Testament does not directly address false teachers or false teaching. I would say it's a pretty important deal. I would say God says that it's a pretty important thing that we are to be careful uh, about taking in false teaching. It's extremely important. It's eternally important. There's many things, and I'm not going to list a bunch of things, but there's many things that God's church, our local church, the global church, God's true believers, there's many things that we can disagree on. There's many things that, that we can have differing opinions on. But there are some things there's no wiggle room. That gospel, that basic gospel message that I, that I uh, talked about earlier, there's no wiggle room. If that is not your foundation, you are not a Christian by God's standards. You can put the name on it. You can say, I, I profess to be a Christian. You can, you can say whatever you want to be but if, if you, or say, but if you do not um, believe in the gospel as stated in Scripture, go read uh, Galatians. And uh, if that doesn't help you, then, uh, then that's between you and God. So there are some things that we have no wiggle room on, we cannot disagree on. And, and uh, the, the scripture is very clear on that. When we're reading or listening, I mean, I don't know how many people do this, but I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I, I listen to uh, different teachers and, and preachers. Um, and occasionally I'll come across somebody that I don't know or I haven't heard of, and I'll, I'll listen to it. Um, and when we do that, maybe, maybe if you're a reader, you may be doing it um, that way. I'm not a big reader. Um, when we're doing that and something comes up that doesn't agree with God's word, bells should be going off. Red flags should be popping up. I've had a time, I was just talking about this with someone yesterday. I was watching TV, I don't know, a couple years ago. And something came on. It, it was a, some kind of preaching, teaching stuff. And, and, I mean, I probably was just watching it just for entertainment purposes because there's nothing very good comes on any TV channel uh, preaching-wise. Um, but uh, on, that, on those specific channels. But anyway, um, it, was, it was talking about the Tower of Babel. And without going into it, it, it was a good thing. Man, I haven't heard anything from Tower of Babylon in a long. I haven't read that. I haven't heard any preaching. But something ain't right. Because there's nothing good associated with Tower of Babel. So I paused it and I went and got my Bible and I'm looking at it. And, and sure enough, yes, that, that was totally wrong. That's where we need to be when we hear something. We need to say, now wait a minute. Something's a little off here. It's a little fishy. And we need to go address that. Let's see if I got a little time here. Um, so I, 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 was, I was debating on, on whether to get into this, but I think i got plenty of time, so I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, there are a lot of, of people out there with false teaching. A lot of big names. Sometimes, you know, we think, well, we can trust somebody because they've got thousands and thousands of followers. They've got, you know, they've got this and they've got that. Well, that, that's not true at all. We have to understand that we have an enemy. There's an enemy out there that, that cannot, did not keep God's Messiah from coming as he wanted to do. 
So now what can he do? He can try to influence people to keep him, them away from the Messiah. And that's, that's what he does. That's what Satan does. That's what sin does. And oftentimes it's very subtle. You know, sin doesn't usually come and kick our front door in and say, hey, I'm a false teacher, listen to me. No, think about, think about uh, the serpent in the garden. Oftentimes it starts with a question. Did God really say? Did God really say that? And then he went on from there to say, well, God just knows that you'll be like him. If you understand this and you know this, God just knows that you'll be like him. That's Satan. It's a serpent in the garden, but it's the same thing we hear today. And another one I've heard a lot lately, maybe not in so many words, but basically it's you've just had it wrong for all these years. For 2,000 years, it's been wrong. The early church had it wrong. Everyone since has had it wrong. This is how it's really interpreted. Like, well, you've got a lot of, a lot of faith in yourself to, to uh, think that you're all of a sudden smarter than, than everybody in church history. But that's what people do. Uh, some of the things that, um, that I'm going to mention fit under headings that, that you may never hear. You may never think of them being under these things, but things like Gnosticism, mysticism, humanism, secularism, prosperity gospel, word of faith, uh, progressive Christianity, and there, there's, there's many. Um, Gnosticism, we read about in the New Testament. Gnosticism has been around for since the early church, um, where the Bible teaches that we are, uh, by children, I mean, by nature, children of wrath. We come into this world because of, of, of Adam's original sin as sinners, uh, enemies of God. Gnosticism says, no, you got a little spark of divinity in you. We all got a little spark of divinity in us. We're just trapped in an in a evil body, surrounded by evil things in an evil world. You just need to seek higher knowledge. Your God's not enough. You need to go past that. There's some knowledge out there for just certain people, and if you seek it, you can find it. That's, that's kind of the focus of Gnosticism, and we, we see that um, even though it may be a little bit more subtle, it's still here. Um, one very prominent teaching that, that probably everybody's aware of, you may have even, even uh, uh, faced this yourself. There may be some here that, that uh, believe it on some level. Um, that God wants no sickness for believers. That it's God's will that you have no sickness. This, to me, is a very detrimental teaching because along with that teaching is this. If you are sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. And let me tell you, your faith has nothing to do with the amount of your faith. Your faith is important because of the object of your faith. You can have all the faith that you can possibly muster up and put it in the wrong thing, and it's going to do you no good. Faith in Christ and Christ alone is what matters. Um, and, and the reason I brought this up is... You know, some of these people literally are preaching while they're wearing glasses and hearing aids. I'm like, it's the irony of it. But there, there was, and, and some of y'all will know who I'm talking about, that one of the biggest names in this teaching has an 11,000-member church, has a school for supernatural healing, like where they teach people healing because it's God's will that everybody should be healed. Um, they do grave soaking. I don't know if you know what grave soaking is. But you go find these old heretical preachers and teachers that have died and you lay on their grave or on their tombstone and you get to absorb some of that heresy, I guess. I don't know. Um, crazy, unbiblical things. And the reason I bring it up, it, it, it's so sad. How, I mean, it, it honestly almost brings tears to my eyes thinking about this. This man just lost his wife to a long-term battle with cancer. This man with an 11,000-member church standing up preaching, God wants you healed. Got his whole church praying for his wife. What does that do to your faith? She died. Sometimes God's will is not for people to be healed. Can God heal? Absolutely. Should we pray for people to be healed? Absolutely. I pray for people to be healed all the time. But I understand it may not be God's will for them to be healed. We don't always know God's will. We, we, we get into this deceptive 
teaching and we miss Jesus. We miss Jesus because we're looking for a, a sign. We're looking for a miracle. We're looking for flashing lights. And we completely miss Jesus. Right along with this teaching um, is that we should all be financially prosperous, right? I mean, if you're not rich, you must not love God. I heard a story, y'all may have read this a few weeks ago, where a pastor and his wife got robbed during a Sunday morning church service. Did y'all see that? Million dollars worth of jewelry they took off of them. That's what the headline said. I didn't get a, you know, I didn't see the appraisal report. A million dollars worth of jewelry on the pastor and his wife. I think the prosperity is only for those who are preaching this prosperity. But the, the, uh, the, uh, the teaching is live your best life now. I mean, that's the message that's being sent, health and wealth. Again, God can choose to heal you, absolutely. He has the power to do so. And I pray that there are people that are healed um, from God's will. But God, came, God sent Jesus not that we could be healthy and, and prosperous and wise, um, all-knowing, but that we as wretched sinners could be saved from eternal damnation. That's why Jesus came. I've heard this reasoning from some of the more mystic teachers. Um, I hope this shocks you. I hope if you've never heard this, you say, that's crazy. There's no way people believe that. Did you know you're made in the image of God? The Bible says so, right? God spoke things into existence, right? Therefore, if God made you and God spoke th made you in his image and God spoke things into existence, you too have the power to speak things into existence. I hope you're shocked by that. There's a lot of teaching out there. There's thousands of people who think they can do that. It's called little God theology. We all become, we can become little gods. Churches are removing or opposing truths like the deity of Jesus. Jesus isn't God. He's just a good man. He's a prophet. They're removing things like biblical marriage. They're removing things like uh, God created male and female. Original sin. God's wrath. And they're replacing these thing, this stuff with things like universalism. First of all, if there is an eternity, if there really is something out there, then it's for everybody. You don't have to do anything to get it. Everybody's going there. People who call themselves Christian pastors, I've seen it, I've heard it, I've watched it. People who call themselves Christian pastors are preaching to thousands of people every week, and they're saying things like, I'm a Christian. That's the, that's the route I chose. But atheism, Buddhism, Hinduism, or any other ism that you want to add, that you want to pick up on, it's just as good. A Christian pastor, supposed Christian pastor, saying it's okay to be an atheist. We accept you just the way you are. God accepts you just the way you are. These are teachings that are sending people to hell. That's why they're important. So what does this have to do with all of this? God's people need powers of discernment in order to distinguish from good and evil. That's what the message is. That's what we built up to here. That's what this verse says. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the words of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. Good is out there and evil is out there. And if you don't know the difference, you're probably not going to go to the good every time. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. We should be disgusted by, we should hate evil, especially an evil that is telling people they don't need Jesus, that are telling people that everything else is just as good as Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us quite different. Jesus is greater than all other things. Um, speaking in this same, uh, same thing about learning and maturing in Christ, Paul said to the Ephesian church, um, Ephesians 4.14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. There's many professing Christians today, whether they're truly Christians or not, 
they're just getting tossed all over the place. Everything that comes along, they just, oh, here's something new. Let me try this for a while. Oh, here's something else. Let me try this for a while. And they, again, they miss Jesus because they're just going off on whatever else is out there. We need to know our scripture because it should be the foundation and the lens by which we view everything else. We need to have a biblical worldview because there are lots of evil out there. We need to see what it is. Oftentimes, we put on this lens of culture, this lens of the world, and we look through that lens and we look at our scripture. We'll never see God through that lens. We must look at everything else, our culture, our feelings. You can't even trust those. Well, but they're mine. I don't care whose they are. can't trust them. You look at them through this. If you're not, you will be tossed to and fro by every wave, every doctrine, every human cunning uh, that's out there. And even the more we know, there's still a chance that we can do that. It's not like, okay, I'm going to read my Bible every day and I'm going to, I'm going to guard against that. Remember, it's not just knowledge. It's not just understanding. We've got to put it to use. He says here through, by being trained by constant practice. I'm not going to get into that much because I know I'm running out of time, but everybody, everybody knows what it means to train. Everybody knows what it means to, to practice. You know, athletes are a good, good example. You know, it doesn't matter how good an athlete is. They can't just sit around and do nothing. They've got to train. They've got to practice. They've got to keep going or they will regress. You can't just sit and soak or you will sour. We must train and we must put it into constant practice. Um, so as we come to a, a close today this time where we we just kind of reflect on God's word and, and maybe maybe hopefully God has, has pointed something out to us that um, that we need to think about and apply in, in our own life just give a, a couple of questions to ponder number one for the unbeliever if there's someone here today or, or listening online or uh, may hear it later um, my question to you is, if you've never put your faith in Christ, if you've never trusted him as your savior, as your savior, why not? Why not? Are you ignoring his call to repent? Are you choosing to uh, be disobedient? Because the call to you today, you've heard it, so it's open to you is to repent and believe the gospel for salvation because there is no other way. Repent and believe in Christ, in Christ alone, his finished work. Nothing else can bring salvation. If you're a believer here today, this is a, this question, it, it kind of kind of hurts when I first read it for myself, uh, thought about it for myself. If your physical nourishment, if what you take in is food every day, if it were equal to what you take in as spiritual nourishment, how would you be physically? Because I believe many professing Christians would starve to death. I think there's times that I would starve to death. The the, uh, we need to be taking care of our body. We need to be taking in food. But there's something much greater, of much greater importance than just our physical body, and we need to be treating that as well. We need to be feeding our uh, spiritual life. So if this is you, whatever it is that may be filling that, that time that, that's causing you to not feed uh, your spiritual life, not feed your faith, not grow in the Lord, 
whatever whatever is taking that time, whether it's selfish desires or or whatever it may be, um, maybe maybe just seeking fortune, maybe we're putting our, our jobs or our, you know our education or whatever it may be. There's things that oftentimes we put in front of God, and the warning to us is you're not only not going to grow, you're going to regress. And when you regress and when you do not grow, you do not, you cannot discern between good and evil. You're not going to drift toward God. We're always going to drift away. So if this is you, then the call to you today is to repent of whatever it is that's doing that. Whatever it is that's keeping you from Christ, repent of that and uh, get right with the Lord. Lord, we uh, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the truths of your word, even at times, Lord, when uh, they're painful to us. Lord, even when they correct us, Lord, we're thankful because it puts us uh, right with you. And Lord, I just pray today that if there's any here that do not know you, if there's any that just need to confess and just get right, Lord, to just give up whatever it is that's keeping them at a distance from you. I pray that today uh, they would do so. Lord, just touch our hearts here with your truth. Um, uh, just uh, draw us closer to you. Lord, help us to uh, just always rely more and more on you in all that we do. I ask it all in your name. Let's stand and worship again. Yeah. Uh-huh.
that is a, a great mystery that uh, blows my mind. Why should I benefit? Why should I reward from what Christ has done? I cannot answer that, but I can praise the Lord for it. And we should do that because we serve a God who is faithful. Um, we serve a loving God that not only loves us so much to save us, but he loves us so much to correct us. And he gives us words like he gave today to say, get on board. Get on board with where you should be. Don't touch the stove. It's hot. Don't forget tonight our business meeting and uh, prayer time. Or, I mean, uh, business meeting and dinner time. That's what I meant to say. Uh, 5 o'clock. And then also next Sunday at 5 o'clock we'll meet here again. So you are dismissed.